Welcome back to another episode of Organic Chemistry. And before we get started today, I just wanted to say thank you all for your support. This channel has been growing so quickly, and I'm so glad that you guys enjoy the videos I've been making. So without further ado, let's get to today's material, ketoles and related rearrangements. But first, let's go through the practice problems that I assigned last lecture. So in the first problem, we have to draw the intermediate and predict the product. And so what we actually first get is we get an oxime. And so what's going to happen is this hydroxylamine is just going to form an imine on this alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And then in the next step, we're able to undergo this rearrangement reaction where the oxygen uh, is able to leave due to the presence of palladium. And we get an aniline as our product. If you'd like to see how this reaction works, I'd encourage you to check out the last video where we go through this. Now in the next problem, we have to fill in the blank. And so here we can see we once again have hydroxylamine, and this is able to form an oxime with this alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And in the presence of thionyl chloride, we can have a one-two shift where we end up getting this N-acetyl vinyl amine as our product. Now in this final problem, we have a multi-step synthesis, which comes from this paper uh, shown here. Um, this is from Carrera's group, and it's a pretty uh, good use of this trimethyl sulfonium iodide. I might be mistaken, this might not be from Carrera's group. And so initially, first what occurs is we form this epoxide through a Cory Tchaikovsky reaction. This is then able to be nucleophilically opened using hydroxyl, uh, using ammonium, which is just ammonium hydroxide because ammonium uh, is formed in water. Now, the thing worth noting here is you might think, well, it's hydroxide. Why doesn't hydroxide just open this epoxide? And the reason for that is ammonia is actually quite a bit more nucleophilic than hydroxide is. And this can be found in Mayer's N-parameter database, which I'll include a link to here. We also have the N-parameter poster available in the Discord resource section, if you're curious. Okay, so the next step is then we diacetize this nitrogen using nitrous acid. And we could form an epoxide, but instead we have a 1-2 shift where we end up ex expanding the ring by one carbon, and we get this ketone as our product. Now let's get to today's material, ketoles and related rearrangements. Now I just have a little bit of follow-up uh, as we had a reaction that was misnamed previously, uh, and then we're going to look at two or three new reactions as well. So the first one is when we have a ketone and we react this, we react this with diazomethane or related compounds such as TMS diazomethane, this is actually technically a buchner curtius schlotterbeck reaction, which is different than what I called it in the last episode. Um, I'll also make a note in the previous episode's description, just kind of making this as a disclaimer. So uh, when this is a two-step process, instead of just having like the diazonium formation, this is a different reaction. Okay, so let's get to today's main material. So the Craggy rearrangement. This looks a little bit like Bayer-Villager oxidation. The difference here is instead of something like MCPBA reacting with a ketone, Instead, we typically have a hydroperoxide, which can be acylated using some acylating agent, such as an anhydride or an acyl chloride, which can then uh, just undergo, usually spontaneously, a rearrangement reaction, forming this uh, ester ketal type product, which can be hydrolyzed to the corresponding ketone. So this tends to have the same rearrangement trends where the, the best migratory aptitude matches what we'd see in Bayer-Villager. If you're curious about what that aptitude is, I encourage you to check out the Bayer-Villager video, which I'll put a link to here. Now, if we hydrolyze this in situ, like if there's water present, we're going to get the ketone, and this could potentially still do Bayer Villager. As if we have um, a paracid present, if if we ever have any free paracid present, this could just do a Bayer Villager. Now, in the case where you have the hydroperoxide and it's just acylated, that shouldn't occur. But if you instead were reacting a paracid with a tertiary position, then you could actually have that happening. But most of the time, uh, in the few reactions of this that have been reported, people just tend to acylate the hydroperoxide, so this isn't a major concern. So some examples include this example here, which is one of the first examples where this trans decalin system is acylated using benzoyl chloride. Then in the presence of methanol at reflux, we rearrange to this uh, ester ketal type product, which can then be hydrolyzed to afford this hydroxy ketone. And we also have a ring expansion. Now you might say, well, the 10-membered ring was already there, but now it's there uh, without having that extra bond making it into a bicyclic system. Now another example includes the treatment of this hydroperoxide with tosyl isocyanate, which is then able to spontaneously rearrange to this uh, this key, this acetal type product, um, as well as some elimination occurs. Now they typically were able to favor the acetal over this uh, this unsaturated product in a ratio of 6 to 1, although there aren't very many conditions in the paper that this came from. Now another cool example shown here is the activation of this hydroperoxide, which was able to tolerate TMS groups, tributyl tin groups, as well as some other functional groups. And uh, here they were able to select for the acetal versus the diene, depending on the base that was chosen. 
So we haven't talked about proton sponge before, but if you typically think about a dimethyl aniline, dimethyl anilines are really bad bases usually, they're pretty weak bases. But when we have proton sponge, because of the conformation of these nitrogens, they end up being an extremely good base. So this is an interesting base that's worth knowing about. Uh, additionally, diterbutylpyridine was what was used to favor this product shown here. Now some considerations is that multiple oxidations can occur. So sometimes these can just keep oxidizing and forming further and further oxidized products such as orthoesters, etc. If you'd like to see some examples of that, you can look at this reference here. There's also a really good review that covers the Bayer Villager as well as the Craigie rearrangement, in addition to many other reactions from the Balstein Journal of Organic Chemistry, and you should check this one out. This is a really good reference. So the next reaction I want to talk about is the alpha ketol rearrangement. And so I'm not 100% sure that this is the earliest publication, but this is one of the earliest publications that you could check out. And so here you can see this is the base mediated alpha ketol rearrangement, where essentially the ketone and the hydroxy group just switch through the shift of an R group. Now this tends to have the same uh, migratory trend as Bayer Villager. However, usually the product has to be more stable than the starting material. So sometimes you see ring expansions or ring contractions, and this is typically substrate specific. Now you could also have a Lewis acid mediated one, and you might get different selectivity depending on whether you're using basic or Lewis acidic conditions. So one cool example shown here is the formation of this imine. This imine, once, uh, once concentrated, is able to spontaneously undergo this rearrangement reaction. So you end up getting a chiral amine from a racemic alcohol starting material, which is just acylated. And then subsequently you get your alpha amino ketone product. So this is a pretty cool reaction, especially for something complex like a steroid derivative. Now in this next example, we can see this ketone containing cyclopropanol is able to be converted to a cyclobutanol, which is quite useful. Now cyclobutanols tend to get engaged in rearrangement reactions, which you'll see in some of the practice problems at the end of this lecture. Now a couple other examples of the alpha ketol reaction include the conversion of this compound here uh, into ketamine, uh, which is in this green chemistry paper. It's kind of an interesting reaction. Hamilton Morris makes a remark of this in one of his episodes of Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, that this is a hard to reproduce reaction. But in this paper here, they talk about several different conditions, including flow conditions, where they were able to accomplish this transformation. Now, another cool example is the ring expansion of this compound shown here, where you can see a five-membered ring is converted into a six-membered ring, converting a 657 system into a 667 system. And I believe that they were able to convert this back to the other form, depending on conditions that were used. Now the last reaction I want to talk about is the benzylic acid rearrangement. Now there's far fewer examples of this in the literature than the previous ones we were just discussing, uh, but essentially the idea is we start with a 1,2 diketone, this is able to convert to a 1,1 disubstituted hydroxy acid, and this doesn't have to be both arils, however cases with arils are the most common in the literature. So the first example shown here demonstrates that an amino group can be tolerated, and so here you can see this rearranged product here. They made some interesting derivatives in this Journal of Medicinal Chemistry paper. It's worth checking out. They made um, quinuclidine derivatives. Now, in this paper here, they were able to form Mosher's acid in an enantioselective form. So I didn't show this here, uh, but they were able to do chiral variants of this, where they end up getting Mosher acid derivatives uh, in quite high conversion and even on a multigram scale in some cases. And so here you can see that the alcohol that was used is this derivative that kind of looks like menthol, as well as this ligand here, which is just like in uh, dihydro, dihydrooxazole. Now another example of the benzylic acid rearrangement is this one shown here, where you can see a ring contraction occurs. So they convert this 666 system into a 656 system with the extrusion of a carbon out here to uh, exocyclic positions. But you can also see that this primary or secondary bromide rather was not tolerated and was hydrolyzed under the reaction conditions. Another cool example shown here is this ring contraction from a six-membered ring to a five-membered ring in this steroid derivative. And so this is quite a cool system as this is a five-ring system converted to another five-ring system, but from all six-membered rings to a five-six-six-six-six system. So this is quite a cool conversion, especially with this yield. Now for this lecture, I'd like to assign a few different practice problems. So in this first lecture, uh, I'd like you to show the mechanism of the following transformation. You can see here is one of the tertiary but cyclobutanols I was talking about earlier. You can see that this undergoes some sort of rearrangement reaction, but the, they use some interesting conditions. So 9-BBN is a hydroboration reagent. This is just a borane. Um, but why would they use this borane for the following transformation? This is part of the mechanism, so I'd be curious if you're able to solve this. 
Um, and then what's the purpose of the hydrogen peroxide in the next step? Well, if you're not sure what hydrogen peroxide does to organic boranes, I'd encourage you to check out the boron 1-2 shift lecture, which I just uploaded a few days ago, and I'll put a card to that here. Now in this final problem, we have this interesting alien. So we haven't talked about aliens very much on this channel, but they're a uh, sometimes challenging functional group that can be very synthetically useful. So this is essentially an enol, uh, an enol ether rather, but it's an allene enol ether, and this is treated with TFA. Now you might know what an enol ether does in the presence of TFA, and so you just apply that same idea here. We're going to get some sort of product, and then it undergoes some sort of rearrangement, and we'll see if you can figure that out. So uh, the last practice problem I'm going to assign is this one here, where we can see this interesting hydroperoxide ether intermediate uh, is then treated with acetic acid and sulfuric acid and this is converted to this corresponding lactone show here. So this is a type of macrolactonization. See if you can figure out this mechanism. So I hope that this lecture has been useful, and if you have any questions or comments, I'd encourage you to leave them below, and it would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed. Have a great day.